Class, hello, this is Dr. Branch. We talked about deontology as the first part of this lecture, and now we're going to discuss virtue ethics and teleology, along with some subsets of teleology. And we're going to talk about these three major theories. Remember, there are three major ways of ethical theory. These are deontology, virtue ethics, or teleology. Those are the basic three theories. So let's talk a little bit about virtue ethics. Virtue ethics um, addresses issues of character and motive and the idea is helping a person become a virtuous person. Now some of my students have mistakenly thought in years past that virtue ethics denies moral absolutes. Virtue ethics does not deny moral absolutes. In fact, the goal of being virtuous assumes that there are some moral absolutes out there to which we should conform ourselves. But really, if virtue ethics focuses on the nature and formation of a good person, the sort of disposition and character traits that make a good person. Perhaps these next two questions will help you understand a bit more. The primary question is not, what should I do? although virtue ethics are concerned about doing the right thing and being a virtuous person, but that's not the primary question. The primary question is, what should I be? Now, for virtue ethics, the assumption is that if someone develops the character traits and habits that lead to the virtuous life, then they will, in fact, do the right thing. So they are concerned about what you do. The classic statement or expression of virtue ethics is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And this is where you get the idea of the golden mean, that the virtuous act or the virtuous person is neither extreme in one direction or another, but some mean in the middle, some, some golden mean in the middle. So if you want an idea of virtue ethics, you could read Nicomachean Ethics. Roman Catholicism has a long history of interaction with virtue ethics. And so I, I have this little chart here Cardinal virtues refers to not a bird here, but the word Latin word cardo, which means hinge, hinge. And the idea is that the good moral life hinges on these four things, much as a door swings on a hinge. Well, a good moral life is going to swing on these four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, or courage, and temperance. And what you need to know is these, these virtues predate the, the birth of the Christian church with the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So these come from classic Greek philosophy. Roman Catholic thought adds to the cardinal virtues, the theological or Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love, or faith, hope, and charity. And so there's still a great tradition within Catholic thought of virtue ethics. This is tied to their view of natural law as well. So I'm just going to introduce you to that and move on. Let's spend a little bit more time with teleology. Now, the most crude way to state teleology is this, the end justifies the means. That's actually a description of some forms of teleological systems. But what I would say to you is there are many forms of teleological systems, some more robust and helpful than others. So let me give you a definition. Teleology comes from two words, telos, which means end, and of course, logos, which means word. So these are ethical systems that focus on the end or the consequence, the goal. What goal is it that we want to achieve? Usually these are considered noble goals. And so teleological ethics address matters relating to ideals, goals, or purposes. And so you're going to determine what's right or wrong by the end result, if you will. This is where you get the crude statement, the end justifies the means. Tele teleological theories focused almost exclusively on ends and or consequences of acts to determine their moral value. So when you're considering whether an act is moral or good, then you look at the result or the consequence that comes from that act. Now, there are several different forms of teleology. The most famous is utilitarianism, which is a subset of teleological ethics. Not all teleological ethics are utilitarian, but all utilitarian systems are teleological, most famously associated with John Stuart Mill. Here is a quote from John Stuart Mill in which he said this, The creed which accepts as the foundation of morals utility, or the greatest 
happiness principle, focused on that phrase, holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. By happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain. By unhappiness, pain and the privation of pleasure. I actually think this is one of the more dangerous paragraphs in the last couple of centuries of moral reflection. And what I'm going to argue here in just a moment is your textbook, The Feinbergs, uh, contrasts act utilitarianism with rule utilitarianism, but I believe they leave out the most common category of utilitarianism, which is hedonistic utilitarianism. I genuinely believe that the average person on the street here in the United States, if you are to try to find out how they how they engage in moral reflection, it is some form of hedonistic utilitarianism, which I think flows directly from what Mill says here. Basically, their own personal happiness is the supreme summum bonum, the ultimate good by which everything is evaluated. And if something makes me more happy, it's good. If it makes me less happy, it's bad. More pleasure is good. Less pleasure is bad. This is especially obvious in sexual ethics. But the Feinbergs don't mention it, but I'm going to ask you about it on the exam. Hedonistic utilitarianism. Here's uh, Calvin and Hobbes. I want that truck, Twinkie. It's mine, Mo. I bought it from home. I said, give me the truck. You can't just take things from people because you're bigger. I'm not taking it. You're giving it to me because we'll both be so much happier that way. And he says, how touching. Well, that gives you an example of how utilitarian ethics can go wrong. And in fact, the greatest happiness principle can become an excuse to exploit other people or in fact to eliminate other people. I'm not saying John Stuart Mill would have advocated the, the mass elimination of entire people groups, but there have been totalitarian regimes and totalitarian countries that engaged in a form of utilitarian thinking which said, well, the greatest good for our nation and the greatest good for our people is to eliminate a certain class of people, and uh, it, it can be quite nasty. And again, one of the greatest problems with utilitarianism is the following question. How do we predict and control the consequences of our actions? The system assumes we know the consequences that are going to come from our actions. Now, there are some actions, certainly we understand the consequences of them, but as a general rule, we, we really don't know the second, third, and fourth order consequences of what we're going to do. So to a certain degree, utilitarianism assumes a level of omniscience for humans, which is reserved only for God. So let me give you some forms of utilitarianism. Act utilitarian theories, basically what those theories say is this. Let's evaluate each individual act on its own, isolate it, evaluate it, does this act bring more harm than does uh, than good? So as we evaluate something as an individual act, that is contrasted with rule utilitarian theories. Rule utilitarian theories uh, really remind me very much of, of Kant and perhaps uh, per, perhaps to a certain degree. I, I said earlier that I felt like some of Kant's thought was actually utilitarian. Perhaps you'll see my ideas here. Most uh, philosophers disagree with me at this point, so I am in a minority. But you, you, rule utilitarian theories say, okay, we're not going to evaluate the act. We're going to evaluate this particular rule. So let me contrast the two. An act utilitarian, let's say someone said, should I cheat on my midterm in Christian ethics? If you're an act utilitarian, you take that individual choice, cheating on the midterm. And let's say you uh, want to maximize your own personal happiness. Well, Dr. Branch is not here at my home. I can fudge and create an email from someone else that claims to have uh, uh, been my proctor. But in the end result, my grade will be higher. My life will be happier. And of course, that is an abuse of act utilitarian, but you see that someone can say, well, I'm going to evaluate this individual act, and the goal I want is a happier, more pleasant life, so I'm going to cheat on the midterm. I said midterm, I meant final. Well, let's take the rule, utilitarian, uh, rule utilitarian. That person might say, okay, what if I adopt the rule that, same question, should I cheat on my final in Christian ethics or not? Let's say that the rule utilitarian looks, uh, rule utilitarian looks at that and says, Okay, what if everyone said it was good and moral for people to cheat on their 
on their finals in Christian ethics. What kind of world would that result in? Well, that would result in a world where you couldn't trust people. And so that would lead many of these people to say, no, we don't want to have a rule that says you can cheat on your midterm. In fact, it's better to have a rule that says uh, you should not cheat on your midterm because that brings more good consequences. So that's kind of the difference between act and rule utilitarian. My, my illustration is not perfect, but it helps you get the idea. And I've already talked about hedonistic utilitarianism. These two are in the Feinbergs. This third is not. But I stress, I really, really believe most people here in the West, um, I know I have many students from outside the United States, but at least here in the West, in particular the United States, some form of hedonistic utilitarianism is the primary form of ethical reflection. This is a system in which a person's own personal pleasure and happiness is the driving motivation. So, I've already talked about that. Let's say just a word about ethical egoism. It's very similar to hedonistic utilitarianism. It claims that all that is necessary and sufficient for an action to be morally right is to maximize one's self-interest. And this is a system that says if you maximize your own self-interest, then you're actually helping others. It's most famously associated with Ayn Rand. And this is a system that many conservative talk show pundits advocate. In fact, some that Christians listen to. I have heard Christian preachers advocating ideas they picked up via right-wing talk radio, and they advocate them as if they are really Christian, but really what they are is they're, they're getting Ayn Rand third-hand, and they don't even know it. And I would just argue that Ayn Rand's system ultimately is not uh, consistent with Christian ethics because we want to focus on others, the good of caring for others and not necessarily your own self-interest. Let me say just a word about emotivism. Emotivism is, I'm not really going to argue as another system, but it's it's a, a way of ethical thinking that pops up a lot in our culture and our world. I'm getting some of my ideas here from Ronald Nash, so I'm stepping out a bit from the Feinbergs. And so this is um, a system that says, eth it's ethical subjectivism, is the belief that whenever people say something is morally good, they mean they like or approve of it. And so this is really a philosophical system. It's not a way of moral reasoning. It's a moral way of critiquing moral reasoning that's popular among some philosophers. And so the idea is something like this. When someone says murder is wrong, they're not really giving you a moral absolute. They're simply telling you how they feel about murder. It's no different from saying, I like collard greens or I like vanilla ice cream or something like that. It's just a statement of your own emotion about something. But here's the critique. If you are consistent in its use, you can never truly be an ethical subjectivist. It's, uh, all moral actions are good and bad at the same time. There's no moral absolutes. No two people could ever disagree over moral matters. I could be talking with someone and I said, well, I believe murdering babies is wrong. And the next person says, I don't believe murdering babies is wrong. But neither one of us are really saying anything substantive. We're just expressing how we feel. So we don't have any genuine moral debate. It, it leads to a culture without sincere and rigorous moral debate, which is healthy and good for a culture. So there's some other critiques you can read there, but here's what Scott Ray says. Emotivism is actually a theory about the use of moral language, not of its meaning. The emotivist has jumped from a theory of use to a theory of meaning without any justification for that leap. Let me say just a couple of words about Christian theistic ethics. First of all, Christian ethics are primarily deontological. It's inescapable. When you have got, when you posit and suggest a God, a God who speaks, he's there and he's not silent, to quote Francis Schaeffer, and he said things like, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. When God says things like that, you're going to be primarily deontological. But there is a teleological component to this degree that, Obedience to God leads to the best consequences, but I would stress for Christian theistic ethics, this teleological component is underneath the deontological statements about what is right and wrong, so it doesn't stand on its own. We're, we're not utilitarians. And certainly we are concerned about virtue. There's a great deal, especially in the book of Proverbs and the New Testament, about being a virtuous person. But again, our virtue flows from the idea that there is a holy God who has spoken certain things. 
and the virtuous life conforms itself to what God has said. So these conform to biblical categories. We want to have this right standard, obedience to laws and commandments. Here's what 1 John 3, 4 says. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And Jesus says, he who has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. So certainly we as Christians are concerned about right standard and obedience to laws. But there's also right motives, and this deals with virtue, love and faith that we are, as Paul said, if I can have faith that move mountains, that move, can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. So we are concerned about our virtue. And then the right goal, the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So again, there's this teleological component to Christian ethics. Let me say just a couple of other things here and I'll be done. A few challenges to ethics that are out there. They're the only options available to secular humans where a standard of authority are concerned are first. The natural universe, culture, or the individual. If you're going to say that God does not exist, ultimately one of those three or some combination is going to be your source of authority. That leads to major problems uh, that if you suggest that all that we are are highly evolved beings that somehow have evolved our ethics as a way to protect the herd and help the herd and help us reproduce, then ethics become extremely subjective and one is hard pressed to say why murdering babies for fun is wrong if, if one really advocates the idea that we are the result of random time and chance. A lot of the atheists which I've encountered in my life are actually bootlegging a lot of theistic language and I try hard not to let them get away with it. I let them know when you start talking about right and wrong, good and evil, something that's beautiful or ugly, those terms don't come with atheism. You only get those concepts in a theistic universe. But if you have an atheistic universe, you get none of those things. You just have what is, and there's really no right or wrong. So those are some of the things I wanted to share with you about these different ethical theories. I hope this has been of help to you. So just to rebrief, let's remember that what we have are... Um, what we have are... Deontology, teleology, and virtue ethics. Keep those in mind.